Africa. And we all know the story about Africa's infrastructure deficit, um, but also because it chimes with the UK's longstanding expertise um, across the end to end picture in this sector. Um, now, the UK is also, as well as being good at infrastructure, we're also pretty good at building what in government terms we call partnerships and alliances um, and what in the private sector I think we call consortia. Um, so, you know, we want UK companies, which we believe are the best in the world, to partner with other world class businesses. Um, and in this case, really to focus on sustainable and high quality infrastructure. In fact, within the UK's Department for International Trade, which I represent uh, as, as Trade Commissioner, um, we here in Africa have delivered the greatest value and best performing infrastructure campaign in the world for the third year running. And so I'm very proud of that and I'm very proud of the team that we've got and who work on all of that. Now, the UK-China Infrastructure Alliance provides a platform which sort of facilitates the industry to industry collaboration, brings together the UK and China in other countries in infrastructure and it is designed to bring together the best in class. Here in South Africa, um, the alliance is spearheaded by government representatives from the UK and China um, alongside our industry partners, Turner and Townsend and China Rail International. And the focus of the work of this alliance across Southern Africa was framed last year in October um, when, we, when we saw the signing of an MOU on infrastructure cooperation between the British Chamber of Business uh, and the South Africa uh, China Economic and Trade Association. And I remember very vividly uh, the ceremony in my garden back in those, those uh, willful days uh, when we took for granted our ability just to hang out together. Um, yeah. And this MOU establishes the intention for both UK and Chinese companies to collaborate on high quality, sustainable infrastructure projects that meet Southern Africa's priorities and support the region's economic growth. Now, since October last year, when we signed that MOU, um, the world, of course, um, has changed. Um, and uh, you know, governments around the world are really looking for ways to kickstart economies that have been fairly brutalized uh, by the pandemic. Um, and of course, many of them are looking at infrastructure projects, including here in South Africa, as a way to stimulate economic growth and job creation. So our work here has never been more important. And if there's one place you should be right now, it's here on this webinar. So congratulations everyone for making the best choice today. And let me, uh, let me leave it there. Thank you. Emma, thank you so much for that introduction. And I agree, this is the best place to be. So well done everybody. And it, actually reflecting back on last year, that, that, part in your garden where we signed the memorandum we had the lord mayor of london there and i remember i was flying off to kenya that very night to go and attend a function at the guild hall the next day we really do miss those days uh and i'm remembering our end of year party when fred and i were there at the auction as well so we, we look forward to more in-person events hopefully very soon but this is the world we find ourselves in and zoom webinars are a great way of us staying connected and sharing the good what we're doing equally this new post-COVID world does represent an opportunity for infrastructure and reimagining and rebuilding. So the topic of Africa rising brick by brick is indeed a metaphor, but equally it is very literal in terms of what we can do as, as partners. Uh, we do have Sean uh, Jordan Kerwin uh, from DIT, the country director with us. He just slipped off the webinar. He'll join us again shortly. I'll introduce him when he comes back on. Uh, Genghis von Streng, uh, head of Chinese infrastructure program from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, joining us from Tokyo. I'm sure there is a story there, Genghis, but I'll hand over to you shortly and you can give us your introductory uh, presentation and remarks. Uh, Fred Wen, great to have you, MD of the China Railway International Group, and obviously heavily involved in SACETA and in driving this memorandum of understanding together. And Vivian Naidu from uh, Turner Townsend, great to have you on board. Perhaps if we just go start with Fred and Vivian, you're kind of opening remarks on this topic and the opportunities and areas you'd like to see us explore during the webinar. Perhaps start with you, Fred. So thank, thank you, Leon. Uh, first of all, I really thank uh, the British Chamber and the MC of China uh, for organizing such a, an amazing webinar for everybody to get back again. And, and it's been feeling so good to have my suits back on. Uh, well, I still have my gym pants, so. <laughs> but but it's, uh, I think it's really um, a really nice thing to get everything back together and, and discuss uh, what we are going to do after this whole lockdown. And, and of course, 
as Leon mentioned, that Africa is rising brick by brick by brick, by brick. and um, both uh, the Chinese and the British partners are, or actually are already starting to explore ways of exploratory uh, of cooperation and collaboration on identifying opportunities and eventually working together to realize mega projects in this continent. Um, I think it's, a, it's very complimentary to have the British and Chinese together because we both have our own advantages. While the, the British counterparts have uh, the strength of funding and also have the experience of doing projects uh, like triple B models projects. And while the Chinese partners have the advantage in building construction and, and the experience of doing technological innovation on building. So, but the question here before everybody is that how do we join the two forces together and, and make things happen? And uh, we had an MU in place, we had a platform. Um, I think the next thing for us to do is to really um, get together more and, and, uh, and start identifying pilot opportunities or pilot projects to work together, whether it's small or big, but it leads to, to test this relationship, but to test this cooperation and see if this will be a solution to help Africa uh, rising up brick by brick. Thanks. Thanks so much, Fred. I'm sure we'll explore that. Uh, Vivian, welcome. Uh, thank you, Leon. And, um, and thank you to, to Emma and Fred as well. And, and as Emma mentioned, uh, uh, last year really culminated in, the, in a momentous occasion. Uh, Fred and I were working through the year to 2019 since we started the UK-China Infrastructure Alliance. And it started off really building the relationship, building the alliance, understanding each, each partner. Uh, and we continued with a series of dialogues. And I'll come back to these series of dialogues because I think it's very important. But uh, what I wanted to confirm or, or, or the message that we wanted to portray was that we involved a wide spectrum of UK and Chinese stakeholders in the infrastructure space and the business space, um, lenders, funders, uh, uh, contractors, legal practitioners, and so forth. And we had common purpose. And I think the common purpose about, was about the amb ambition for Africa, ambition in terms of the opportunities, and the desire to forge those new relationships. So we started in a great place. And I think where we are now, you know, I must hit it on the nail, the, the world has changed, but the discussions that we had at that point are still very relevant. And what we had unpacked between UK and Chinese firms, together with some of the South African partners at that stage, were things like innovative financing, alternative procurement. We looked at common barriers that we were facing localization, local content, supply chain issues as well. And to be honest, if I, I reflected back and looked at those topics, where we stand now, sort of six to eight months later, in the COVID or sort of post-COVID scenario, those topics are very, very much relevant. And I think we started discussions early, we've made progress, and we've got to find a new way to stimulus and to kickstart uh, what we started last year. And I think this is, like Fred said, it's a great start, We've had a few good discussions. We had uh, SITSA, the symposium, Infrastructure Symposium in South Africa. And in this month as well, we had the extraordinary China-Africa Summit as well. A commitment again from, from China uh, to Africa, to various African leaders. You're just on mute there, Vivian. We just lost your mute. Apologies. The right platform to actually kickstart the UK-China Infrastructure Alliance. So definitely looking forward to the, to the year ahead. Thanks, Leon. Thanks. Thanks so much, Vivian. And we'll no doubt come back to some of those points in our first few questions. Sean, uh, Country Director for the Department for International Trade. W welcome. Great to have you on the webinar this morning. Just wondering if you have any opening remarks before we deep dive into uh, Genghis's opening presentation. Thank you, Leon, and, um, and great to be great to be on the line, and great to be speaking to so many people. Um, it's uh, fantastic that we have this partnership with the with the British Chamber here, um, and always a pleasure to be to be speaking with Leon and with others. Um, so, very very brief remarks from me, I think. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about partnership, and as the UK government, partnership is is central to a lot of the work that we do here in South Africa. I think underpinning that, there are there are two really firm beliefs for us. Um, 
the first is a belief that um, that trade and investment um, is, is a key driver of growth and prosperity uh, for, for both the UK and for South Africa uh, and is, is, is at the front and center of, of any kind of forward looking um, uh, partnership. And we're delighted to be able to be engaging with, 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 with China, the Chinese government, with Chinese companies um, to fulfill that. Um, and the second is that um, uh, partnerships between government and the private sector um, are absolutely critical to that story of growth, prosperity um, that, 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 that we're talking about. Um, and that, that this alliance is all about bringing the best of capability from, from the UK companies that we promote, represent and engage with, with counterparts on the Chinese side and with, with counterparts here in South Africa to deliver on those, those ambitions. Um, so it's really brilliant to have these types of interactions. Um, you know, I think my other point would be, you know, we, we, we can't be speaking now without uh, mentioning, you know, the impact of COVID-19. Um, it's been it's been dramatic and continues to be dramatic and not in a good way, both in the UK and in South Africa. Um, but that being said, that doesn't mean that, that now isn't a time to talk about economic recovery, um, a time to talk about how we can work together to, um, to, to, to overcome some of that impact. And I think it is an absolutely appropriate time to be talking about how partnership can support economic recovery and can begin to, to, to bring us out of what has been a, a really quite, um, a quite a, a difficult time. Um, you know, the president spoke at the Inf uh, infrastructure symposium last week and spoke about um, infrastructure being the flywheel of recovery. Um, you know, that's something we, we wholeheartedly support. And I think we'd add to that and say that trade and investment in the infrastructure space will be the flywheel of recovery. Um, and it's partnerships like this, that which, are, which are really going to drive that. So it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking um, with such great uh, colleagues on, on, on the panel and, and with, with such a great uh, audience. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, everybody. Uh, really quite an, an optimistic way to kick off the webinar is you know we have these issues we're in the post-covid context but what i'm hearing is so what what can we do together to accelerate our recovery and i love the flywheel analogy in terms of getting that going that's quite a nice engineering metaphor but very very apt and appropriate you'll see my colleague cecilia on screen as well she's going to be feeding in your questions if i just refer you to the q a function on your control panel Please feel free, anything that's burning front of mind, comments, observations, please comment there and we will feed that in to the session. Genghis, welcome. Uh, please tell us, we're not talking about trade with Tokyo or Japan today, so I know we've got you from Tokyo. Perhaps tell us why you're there, how you're there, <laughs> and kick us off with your opening remarks. Thank you. Leon, thank you very, very much yeah. to yourself, to colleagues from the Chamber for putting on um, a really exciting webinar today, and also to colleagues uh, at the High Commission, um, Sarah and, and obviously Emma as well, um, and Sean. Um, so yes, as you as you pointed out, I am in Japan at the moment. Um, normally, I'm based at the British Embassy in Beijing, uh, where I lead on the UK government's China Infrastructure Program as part of the Prosperity Fund, and which is all which is all about bringing together UK and China Chinese expertise to deliver high quality infrastructure, uh, particularly in Africa and in and in wider Asia. Um, so it's just a, a bit of a quirk of, of how things played out around COVID that I've, I find, find myself in Japan. Fortunately, not in Tokyo, um, but in more uh, idyllic southern Japan, um, where there are fewer crowds. So, uh, uh, but, uh, but things, are, things are getting back to normal here. Um, and we are, we are negotiating with, uh, with our Chinese counterparts uh, the return of, of colleagues like myself who are still stuck outside of China at the moment. So we're looking forward to returning to China soon. Um, so I, I thought I'd just spend um, maybe a couple of minutes at the outset to, uh, to provide a bit of uh, context and background, um, a bit of an overview of, of um, what we've been doing with China bilaterally between the UK and China over the last couple of years. Um, to further this agenda of trilateral cooperation, a little bit about, um, about what's happening in, in, in terms of that cooperation in Africa, um, and, um, and, and some ideas coming through in terms of addressing some of these questions about, you know, how do we, how, how do we get together and move, move on to uh, concrete collaboration. Um, so I think the UK, you know, we identified probably a few years ago now that trilateral, this, this concept of trilateral cooperation um, was, was really, you know, had sig significant potential as a growth area um, in the UK-China relationship, um, which could make a really uh, important impact uh, to the global good. And there were a number of factors and some which have been uh, mentioned already. Um, so obviously, you know, China is 
the largest foreign uh, infrastructure you know, player in particularly in Africa's infrastructure development. Um, but at the same time, a number of projects I think we've seen, you know, probably to date have not delivered the benefits that were originally anticipated, maybe or hoped for. Um, we're also seeing the, you know, the, the traditional China model, one might say, of financing and delivering projects, um, probably coming under a little bit of strain. I mean, this is, we're talking in a pre-COVID world now. Um, with, with you know, rising debt levels, uh, fewer sovereign guarantees available. I think Chinese financial institutions as well becoming more rigorous in their risk assessments. And then in host countries in Africa in particular, you know, a greater appetite for private participation in infrastructure delivery, rolling out of PPP programs across the continent. Um, but also, um, you, know, you know, we see a, a rising demand for higher standards, local employment, uh, these kinds of issues. Responding to that, um, you know, Chinese contractors, the big Chinese infrastructure companies, China Rail, I think, and others, you know, who have been involved in much of this, you know, they're really now looking to transform their business models from traditional EPC contractors to longer term um, partners in some of these projects as investor operators. Um, but this obviously brings a whole range of, of challenges along with this. And, uh, and this is where we see the UK can really um, come in and play a role with, with exactly the complementary types of skills that, uh, that I think Emma and Fred were touching on. Um, so the traditional U UK areas of strength around design, legal services, financial structuring, PPPs, reputation for high quality, um, but also with this longer term promise of being a source of private capital from, from London and from some of the UK financial institutions. So I think that was the background for, for us identifying this trend within government. Um, and so from that starting point a couple of years ago or over the past several years, I would say, I think that, that the UK has really developed the most um, substantive partnership um, in terms of trilateral cooperation with China um, out, of, you know, out of all our um, peers that are, that are engaging in this. Um, so in June last year, we saw a high level MOU signed between the UK and China on infrastructure cooperation in third markets. And the focus of the MOU was really on identifying specific projects for collaboration. Um, and so a number of countries, a number of European countries and others have signed similar MOUs with China. But I think the, um, you know, the, the sort of the landmark with this one was we saw probably the most robust language in terms of the importance of high standards in the MOU. We saw for the first time agreement uh, in terms of the text on the importance of debt sustainability. Um, we saw a reference to the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment. So really it's a landmark MOU in terms of you know, some of the text and some of the ambitions on both sides on infrastructure cooperation. Building on this MOU, um, we, we launched the China Infrastructure Program as part of the Prosperity Fund, um, a three-year program um, in partnership with the Chinese government and in particular the National Development and Reform Commission, our counterparts in, in Beijing. Um, and this is um, you know, providing a, a, a sort of a systematic platform for, um, for delivering on the, the ambitions of the MOU. Um, and there's really three areas of, of, of work as, as part of this program. And we're in, we've just, we've just come to the end of year one. Um, so we're in, we're in full flow and we, we expect to continue through despite the, uh, the challenges of COVID. Um, so the first area is really traditional, uh, you know, sort of capacity building, knowledge sharing with Chinese companies and financial institutions around best practice for infrastructure delivery with a view to developing policy recommendations and industry guidance. The second um, key area is, touches on something that Fred was, um, pointing to, which is, is, is pilot projects. Um, and really the idea is to, to provide project preparation and transition, transaction support um, to assist the development of, of high quality and bankable projects with Chinese companies. Um, but, but really that can be done in quite a flexible and a way that and deployed quite quickly. Um, so we're particularly focused on projects that can act as, as demonstrators um, in terms of uh, new financing and delivering models, um, which we've talked about, that can, that can involve private capital participation and that, that as a result build the host country capacity needed to, to roll out projects of this kind. And the third area of, of, uh, is business facilitation activity as much as what we're doing today. Um, and, then, and then flowing through from there um, over the past, um, so towards the end of last year into this year, uh, the NDRC, our counterparts in China, identified over 30 um, uh, 
projects for consideration as pilots. Most of these happen to be in Africa, um, which is quite exciting. Um, and obviously, we, there's, there's issues with COVID. A lot of these projects are paused um, for various reasons. Um, but we are quite, um, quite encouraged that, um, you know, the first one or two of these projects might be able to move forwards in the, in the coming months. Um, maybe I'll just touch on um, very quickly, a um, bit more widely within the UK government. Um, and again, Emma, Emma touched on this. Um, so the UK, we've, we've now established a network of uh, dedicated staff resource um, focused on supporting UK and Chinese companies to work together on trilateral cooperation. Um, so we've got colleagues on the ground in South Africa um, with Sarah Green, um, who's on this call as well, uh, also in Egypt. Um, and we've also got colleagues in, in London and in China um, dedicated to, to, to helping coordination with this. And I think that's, again, unprecedented in terms of, um, in terms of countries working with China on this topic. Um, and then obviously we're, 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 it's really great to see that this is um, starting to be reflected um, on the ground and, and South Africa, an excellent example of this with the two chambers coming together, um, you know, this MOU being signed and, uh, and, and particularly exciting that we're, we're having a, an industry led approach with, uh, with Turner and Townsend and, and China Rail, um, you know, taking the lead in terms of um, coordinating the industry response. Um, so very encouraging what we've been seeing prior to COVID and, and continuing through COVID and moving beyond um, conversations on collaboration to really now where, you know, partnerships are being explored, whether it's healthcare and rail in Egypt, roads, affordable housing in Kenya, renewable energy and transport in Southern Africa, um, and with that potential for, for innovative new models. Um, so I'll, I'll end with that. Um, I know we're keen to get into the discussion and, uh, and hear more from, from the experts on, on what this really means in, in the South African context. Um, but so thank you very much again, uh, Leon and, uh, and fellow panelists and everybody for joining and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. No, th thanks very much for that, Jeng. This is a, is a great way to kick us off. Uh, so really, all this is re reliant and depend upon the, the macro context and ha how we navigate that and how a government navigates that. So what are we seeing as individuals in terms of where we are now? What are the timescales in terms of returning to some type of economic activity? Uh, and it'd be quite an, op an interesting opportunity to ask the audience their views. And so I could cue in the first poll there. How soon do you think we will see a global economic recovery to pre-COVID-19 levels? Uh, it would be great as, we're, as the audience are considering that question, perhaps I could come to Emma and Sean before going to Fred and Vivian just in terms of our views what are, we, what are we hearing from government what are we sensing what is the data telling us Leon do you mean in terms of sort of the the pace of economic recovery yes yeah yeah so well let, let me kick off and um then others uh who probably have um, much better insights than i do um can can add in um look i think the, the the short answer is it depends on the sector um so you know, there is there isn't you know, we're seeing a, a, a it's difficult for everybody um but it is more difficult for some than for others and uh, and it is more difficult for some economies than for others um depending on um, you know, just the, the sort of the, the business environment, the scale with which um, governments are leaning in and making uh, essential policy shifts uh, to encourage more economic growth. I think in the infrastructure space, um, you, I, I sort of hear conflicting analysis, to be honest. So on the one hand, you know, we are seeing uh, projects shift to the right um, because of lockdown. We're not able to get people, you know, workers onto construction sites. Uh, we're not necessarily able to sort of initiate new projects. Um, uh, funding squeeze, liquidity problems, debt sustainability questions, um, all sort of exacerbated um, because of COVID-19 and lockdown. But then, of course, the flip side of that is that governments now are having, having sort of done a lot of that uh, immediate response work um, and got healthcare systems in as strong a place as possible. Um, you know, there is now that sort of uh, slightly bit more um, bandwidth to be thinking about the economic recovery and what is required. So we're seeing initiatives like in the, with the South African government of the Invest Infrastructure Symposium to really sort of put down a clear marker uh, and drive 
uh, infrastructure as, as a, a sort of catalyst for economic growth and job creation. Um, so I think it will depend a little bit on, on funding availability, um, whether we see you know, the drop in investment really starting to impact on new infrastructure projects coming through, whether we're able to see the DFIs um, mobilizing some additional resource specifically around infrastructure um, to enable that, um, whether we see uh, regulations and legislation shifting to enable more, more governments to comfortably move into PPP um, to support uh, infrastructure financing and that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, then I think there's an imperative for all of us about how do we actually tackle those challenges that we were always facing, um, particularly in Africa, yeah. in infrastructure projects, and use this as a moment to really drive the changes that we need to see, including around um, you know, project preparation, um, feasibility studies, bankability studies, and that sort of thing. So, you know, um, would I put a time frame around it? Look, I think there's there's a lot of work still going on, um, uh, whether it's in the background or, or we're seeing you know, active sites, construction sites sort of reopening. Um, uh, but I think it's gonna be, uh, you know, a, a, at least a year, I would say, um, before we start to see things um, sort of picking up again. Um, so so I, if I was allowed to vote, which I'm not, um, <laughs> uh, I would definitely put the one to three years um, vote for me. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Emma. Emma, perhaps we could see the results of the poll there. So it looks like people agree with you, Emma. <laughs> yeah. So less than one year, 4%. So I think uh, none of us are uh, boisterously optimistic. Perhaps the pragmatic approach is one to three years where essentially two thirds of us are three to five years, some 37% and then 2% five years plus. Uh, Sean, what are your observations there? And I think just picking up on a few things that Emma said in terms of there is a funding opportunity, which we'll come on to, a DFI opportunity, but equally we're looking at the kind of Roosevelt-esque Boris New Deal that we're seeing in the UK. Is this a real opportunity to re-energize economies, uh, shake up the industry in terms of feasibility studies, speed to action, mobility of talent, dealing with unions to really dr to drive that economic growth? Is, are we seeing an opportunity to perhaps be more efficient there? Yeah, well, perhaps if I speak to the to the South Africa side of things first, and then touch on on yeah. on um, what's going on in the UK. So, yeah, look, so I you know, I think we we, we have seen um, we've seen really significant and tangible movement um, from from the South African government around infrastructure development, and um, it is a key driver of economic recovery. Um, we've seen more movement in the infrastructure pipeline space than we we have for a number of years. Um, and I think that, that COVID-19 is going to be a further kind of um, economic and political uh, 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 driver for, 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 for speeding up that process. Um, I think we're still waiting um, for, for the really critical shifts there. So we're still waiting for, for that list of, of bankable projects. Um, we're still waiting for a kind of a full understanding of, of how these projects will be funded and um, for those who attended the, the infrastructure symposium last week, that, that there was mention of a range of different funding models, um, but, but an ask from the president that the private sector stump up cash for it as well. Uh, and so I think working through the, the legislative and the kind of the procurement models and processes for that will, will be absolutely critical um, to determine the types of timeframes on which these, these, these projects can be brought forward. So, I, you know, I think there's, there's real political space, there's a real economic imperative, there's been genuine and substantive movement, um, but there's still a little more to be done for us to see things moving at that kind of rapid pace, which would be really necessary for, for infrastructure projects, infrastructure development to be that flywheel. Um, and I think, you know, um, probably in a similar situation in, in the UK, you know, absolutely clear that, that, that the economic stimulus, the government stimulus, that, that the government policy is going to be um, a key player in, in economic recovery. Um, and, you know, our prime minister has been clear that he sees spending as uh, government spending as a key way of kind of kicking things on and driving things forward. Um, and now it's, it's working through the detail of how that, how that lands um, and what that looks like. So I think the next couple of months from a government perspective are absolutely critical, both in the UK and in South Africa, um, to really to, to line up the policy and the details behind that clear political commitment um, to, to make infrastructure um, deliver against the, the promise that we all believe it has. Thank, thanks, Sean. And I'll take this opportunity to welcome Domingo Zhang from the Chinese Embassy. Welcome, Domingo. Uh, 
I'll come to you shortly. We're just finishing off a first question and I'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and, and your role. Perhaps Fred and Vivian, your, your views on, on, the, on the same question in terms of timescales and opportunities to deliver an effective recovery. Yeah, Leon, maybe I can start a little bit with the uh, with introduction to China Railway situation currently. So mm -hmm. everybody can understand a company like us, especially we have a lot of peers of mine who work for the other state-owned Chinese companies. And we probably share the same situation right now. Um, from the perspective of our headquarter, uh, the reality is a lot of, of my colleagues are stuck in China. They can't be mobilized uh, to go overseas and carry out their job. And people like me are stuck outside of China because we can't go back uh, to, to, to conduct meetings and conduct negotiations with, with the banks back in China, with our partners back in China. And apparently because of the COVID-19 thing, everybody is stuck. And uh, because of that, uh, things are really moving very, very slowly. But from the perspective of industry, um, tenders are delayed, mobilization for construction are delayed, uh, a lot of negotiations between uh, and companies and between governments are, are postponed. Um, of course, people are doing a lot of things like we're doing today. People are doing a lot of things online, have online meetings, but I guess people are human after all. We are still used to, I mean, personal meetings, face-to-face -face meetings. And, and these uh, online meetings are not really, it's, it's just getting people back together but not really making executive, I mean, uh, substantial progress in terms of pushing for, forward uh, for projects. Uh, from our perspective, um, I, I think uh, the industry will only be back within, within a year or so uh, because construction industry is a little bit different from productions and manufacturing. Uh, for example, to, to start from, from an MOU to really put the project on the ground and start building, uh, with, even without COVID-19, that will take us two or three years. And, and, and with this lockdown, um, to really develop a project from the start, to, to really uh, put everything on the ground, that will take even longer. And that is um, uh, something that we can't even estimate. So, um, so one year three, I think that's very practical. Um, uh, I believe after lockdowns over, all governments, public sectors and private sectors will definitely fast track um, the work that we left before the COVID-19 and uh, people will move quickly and more quickly than before. Um, and yeah, and hopefully uh, between the UK and China, we can also uh, identify some opportunities uh, during the lockdown period and, and move uh, fastly uh, after the thing's over. Thank you, thanks Fred. Vivian, how are things at Turner Townsend? What are you seeing? Yeah, uh, thanks, Leon. Um, I, I think similar to the colleagues, we, we're seeing recoveries vary in the different sectors and the different markets, uh, and depending on on the maturity of the clients, the depth of the balance sheet, and so forth. Um, but I think the spread is really about sentiment as well. Um, you know, there's the second wave scenario that's tempering some views and and uh, and constraining some. Uh, Risk taking and wanting to move ahead on projects, so that's that's really informing. I think the the spread that you're seeing in terms of the uh, when the recovery happened, but I, I would tend to agree with my colleagues uh, around that space. Having said that, we are increasingly getting involved in portfolio reprioritization, understanding what exactly can be done within this space. Um, we speak about the f studies and, and the uh, feasibility work where you can use the benefit of the time to get projects that are in study phase progressed, be ready for the next uptick, be ready for when you can mobilize teams. We are seeing a lot more resurgence in, the, in, in, in that space, uh, in that type of work. Um, we are seeing clients reorganizing themselves. So we speak about capital business continuity. So not specifically, and Capital business continuity really speaks about what we're talking about today, infrastructure, and, and it, it really is uh, takes a different tact in terms of understanding uh, what resources you need, what decisions you make, what's your risk alignment, and how to then refocus your business. And uh, in that 
capital business continuity that we're talking to clients about. It's understanding if you are deferring major projects, it then means you've got to relook at maintenance strategies, understand how you still be compliant in the, from a regulatory perspective, from a legislative perspective. So that means expenditure must still happen. It happens in a different shape or form. You're managing smaller projects, but maybe more a greater volume of projects. So, at the, so that is the balance that we are seeing clients bring into play in terms of both how can we plan and use the time, and how how do we still remain compliant, still get expenditure going, from a from a construction site perspective. Uh, we're providing more views in terms of what does the new health and safety regime mean? So if we are going in with a new budget, are we factoring in the social distancing, the limited uh, teams that you're gonna have in play? Let's bring that to the fore and make sure that your budgets are being re uh, revised, for instance. So we are seeing, for instance, you know, just health and safety measures are gonna add sort of between one to 2% in preliminaries. So factor that in now, but do your planning in now. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's where we can use the time quite productively now so that we are ready for, for when the floodgates open. Um, Perhaps, but, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, you've triggered, all of you have triggered quite a few sub subsequent questions for me on that. And in terms of, we're looking at a one to three year recovery period. So from a financing perspective and you know, capital business continuity perspective, what is available for us? What is the opportunity? How do these businesses, how do your businesses survive while we're going through this reorientation waiting to come out of lockdown? And with that, there are a number of questions. You know, is there an opportunity to reimagine the future of infrastructure? You know, I live out by Lanseria and the whole concept of the Lanseria smart city. Uh, the president spoke about it before we went into lockdown uh, and, and that was addressing a, a new way of doing infrastructure. What are your observations and what are you looking at in terms of how is your business going to survive for the next one to three years? But equally then, what support and funding opportunities, challenges are available to you? And maybe we could go to Fred and Vivian and then Emma and Sean can, could give your macro observations on that. Yeah, Leon. Uh, yeah, you, you, you're mentioning uh, the smart city development in Lanceria, and it's very interesting because we're also very interested in such developments. And actually in North West province, we also follow a similar project. Um, I think projects like smart city developments, uh, these such projects are really changing the landscape of future project developments. Uh, we're not talking about building one single apartment or one single office, it's about building a new town. Um, and such projects are actually gonna be involved uh, with many more stakeholders and traditional projects, um, governments, private companies, communities, and a lot more than that. Um, what we really talking about, the UK and China really talking about solutions and talking about opportunities, I think is, is, is really a, a, a kind of motivation for both sides to understand um, the traditionals, even the traditional PPP models are not really working in this, in this, in this continent. The UK has a lot of experience of developing triple Ps and a lot of success, like the water project, Metro in London, very success, successful. And China has been very experienced in doing triple Ps domestically. Um, and, uh, but when it comes to Africa, we all know that triple B model, it's not a simple model. Uh, it's, it involves a lot more than traditional EPC projects. And actually the requirements of a triple B on the public sector is even more. Um, we all know that the African continents, uh, all governments are facing similar issues like debt issues, like poor management of infrastructures. Um, and uh, and uh, we must, I think from out, we must see this differently. The poor management of infrastructure development, uh, the debt issues, the legal system um, and, and financial system in, in this continent are not really the reason why we should try to use triple B, but, uh, but rather a context in which we are proposing to do to doing triple P. And because of this context, we have a lot of challenges. And, um, and so that's why we, we're really excited to see UK, China and South African governments are really talking to each other on a government to government level, because for the private companies, for the private capital, the only thing that they want is secure and, and proper return. And, and that needs to be guaranteed on a government level. Um, the public sectors must play a bigger role in terms of pushing project like smart city developments, like these triple B models. Thanks, Fred. Do you want to come in there, Emma? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so just a, a few additional thoughts there, really. Um, 
so we're, see, we're seeing and hearing this um, a groundswell from certain parts of societies around rebuilding better uh, and, and governments and businesses around the world are sort of jumping onto this, uh, this sort of phrase as a way to say, look, it, nobody asked for this, nobody expected it uh, to happen now, um, but it's happening. And so what can we do to be bold and innovative now in the decisions that we're taking about infrastructure projects, um, about policies, um, to reset the dial, to imagine a different future and to create that future now through, through bold decision making today. And I think you know, part of that is, is sort of stimulated by um, you know, climate change and, and thinking about how do, we, you know, how do we transition our energy mix? How do we um, uh, build, you know, sort of how do we take carbon out of, out of all different parts of our economies? But part of it is also stimulated by um, this dramatic shift that we have all experienced. And, and people thinking, actually, there is... What, is, what does the future look like? Not just the future ways of working, but the future ways of living. And how do governments and, uh, and, and sort of companies inspire uh, the creation of a future that, that that people want to see. What impact will this have on urbanization rates? And what does that mean in terms of building those smarter cities? Where, do, where does that infrastructure need to be? Um, what does it mean in terms of people's willingness to uh, to jump and cram onto public transport in the future? Mm -hmm. you know, will that have an impact? And then what does that mean for our transport plans, whether it's roads or it's rail or, or something else? Um, and uh, and how do we use technology most importantly across all of, of all of our sectors? So tech tech has been the sort of the, the king and queen of, of this um, pandemic experience. Um, enables this sort of thing to be happening all around the world at much greater levels than was possible um, four months ago. Um, but but it's not just this sort of thing. It's like actually how are we using technology and innovation in every aspect of our economies and our societies and our communities to change the way that we. Uh, we work and we live. I think it's really exciting um, and I think that um, there are huge opportunities here for, for that innovation, for that creativity, for that entrepreneurship to come to the fore but we need to change our mindsets in order to grasp those opportunities. Thanks Emma, no, I agree, agree 100% and there is the opportunity, the mindset paradigm shift. Cecilia, I believe we've got some questions from the audience. You're on mute there Cecilia. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Um, I think this is going to tie in nicely with what Emma was actually saying just now by being bold um, and reimagining the future. There is possibly now an opportunity to leapfrog. And I think over the past three yeah. months, particularly, Emma mentioning how much is the appetite to actually get on a bus or a train. So I, I even think some ideas that we might have had about Africa's infrastructure and future cities for Africa might now also have shifted um, after COVID. It might be okay for people to, to not have mega super cities, but rather develop rural cities, um, more cultural hotspots. Um, and I think it, it ties in with what Adelaide Chiangwe was asking, particularly she'd like to know what Fred would think, um, saying China is known for its very swift project completion in its home market. And this is something that's really needed in Africa, swift execution of these things. Um, how, how do you think is that achievable, particularly now when we all know that we're going to see at least a one to three year recovery period still, but is that possible for Africa? And also, can we do it with a sustainable agenda to Rene Sachman also mentioned are we also bearing in mind that there is a triple bottom line of sustainability that we must also bear in mind. Yeah, I, and I'm looking at the question right, right now. I think it's a very good question. Um, but well now to complete a project in a swift way, it involves more than a certain project. It involves a lot, more, a lot of stakeholders. The reason why there was, uh, for example, the Kevin Hospital uh, was completed within a month in China uh, during the COVID-19 epidemic. And that involves more than a company. It involves the local community support, it involves the government support, capital is there, and all the suppliers, the subcontractors, they're doing without consideration of 
of, of anything they, or their goal was really focused to complete a project. Of course, that's a quite a special situation, but in, in our normal market environment to, to have a swift completion of project in Africa, and as we can see there, it's quite a, it's quite a different landscape we're seeing for, for the Chinese companies doing Africa and doing jobbing in China. Uh, I can give it a very good example. Uh, I'm not going to mention the name of the company in the project, but there was a certain project in Southern Africa continent uh, uh, countries uh, where we see a power plant which was severely delayed and uh, it was done by a Chinese contractor. The capital was ready. Uh, the government, both governments are very supportive, but the project still suffered from a substantial delay. Why? Um, uh, of, and of course, all the, all the conditions are met. Uh, all the Chinese specialists are mobilized and the local communities are heavily involved. I think uh, there's one thing that everybody usually miss is that uh, why do we keep having delays on completing project in Africa? I think that doesn't apply to Chinese company, companies only. It applies to everyone. Uh, I, I mean, this happened to all companies all around the world. I think one of the key reasons that we keep missing is that they, involvement of stakeholders and um, to, to, to make sure every, well, make it simple, everybody should be happy when we, when we start a project from day one. Uh, coming back to that power station, why it was delayed? Not because of construction, not because of chemical mobilization, but because of the education of local communities from day one. Uh, the environmental study wasn't done properly. Uh, the feasibility wasn't done uh, according to standards. Uh, when it comes to, to the middle of the construction, and everybody's raising questions. And because of those questions and things has to be stopped and delays will happen. I think that's, that's the, uh, those are the things that the Chinese companies and all companies around the world needs to focus on from day one of starting developing the projects which make sure everything will be ticked and uh, in a textbook way, uh, make sure you're doing things according to the rule and you don't get a stop during the middle of construction. Thanks, Fred. I, I saw you wanted to come in there, Sean. Yeah, just um, you know, just a, a quick reflection on 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 how this kind of this sentiment around build back better might might be felt in the industry. I mean, I think two reflections um, really. So, you know, one, I think we'll, we'll increasingly see um, a level of scrutiny and, and and slightly different criteria used from governments around um, selection and prioritisation of projects and where they want to to put money and to, to focus attention. Um, you know, we've already seen this with the, the SIDS methodology here in South Africa with a big focus on, um, you know, on the, the connectivity industries, um, looking at how, how infrastructure can deliver real world impact. And I think that will be absolutely critical when, uh, you know, we as, as kind of government and, and industry actors are thinking about where they want to put time and effort is, is understanding that prerogative from government. Um, I think we'll also see it in terms of um, who they're looking to deliver, though. Um, you know, we're already seeing in the UK a big focus around um, around space, the spatial element to delivery, um, the geographic element in terms of, um, you know, uh, the Prime Minister's commitment to, to to level up across the country. And I think that will be reflected in, in how projects are also commissioned. Um, and again, we're seeing that here in South Africa. You know, there have been lots of... Um, Lots of, uh, of discussions that we've had around, you know, how to bring together consortia, how to ensure you've got local content, um, you know, kind of requirements met. And I think that that's likely to only continue um, as we're looking at infrastructure development in the context of its role in economic recovery uh, and in, in kind of delivering things. And that, that leads me to my final point, which I think, you know, we need to be careful about seeing infrastructure as kind of the, 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 the silver bullet, which is going to solve everything. And I think, you know, um, there's an element of realism which has to be brought in. Um, you know, you can't, while you can introduce elements of prioritization and you can pick and choose projects in terms of the impact they deliver, it, it can't deliver everything. Um, and I think that's true on the kind of the delivery side of things, you know, why you can have um, a huge number of kind of requirements around who can deliver uh, infrastructure projects. You, you've got to be realistic that, that there is a, that there's a, there's a market here and there are private sector actors and it needs to be responsive to that as well. So I think there's an element of realism around the infrastructure debate, which needs to be brought in as well. Thanks, Lil. Thanks very much, and, and really picking up on quite a few observations. You know, Emma, Emma referred to reimagining the way we do things in this opportunity, and Fred really commenting on uh, how you can't do this in isolation. Very much what Sean was saying. We need partnership. Uh, we could argue that Africa perhaps needs our alliance from the UK and from China more more so than ever. Where are we in terms of our? We we had the infrastructure symposium last week, but are we really sensing and feeling that there's a real commitment uh, to engage with us? 
so that we can meaningfully do something together quickly. As we discussed last year, it's great to sign this paper, but so what? What are those opportunities for us to engage with government partners, be they munis at municipal level or, or more federal, national level, uh, to engage? Perhaps, Emma, you could give us some, some views on that. I'm actually going to pass straight over to Sean, actually. <laughs> yes, that's um, handing right over. <laughs> from a South African perspective, thank you, yeah. Thank you, Emma. Um, no, so I mean, I, I think I think you know that there's uh, with the the, the, the reorganisation of the South African government's infrastructure um, kind of policy and procurement processes through the, the Presidential Infrastructure um, Commission. Um, you know, we've seen um, real and kind of substantial shifts in in the extent to which we can engage with the South African government on on these issues in a kind of government to government capacity um, and, and and we've been really encouraged by that process um, it was fantastic to have the South African government represented at the UK's um, Africa investment summit um, back in in January um, and and to have them represented at the, the the sustainable infrastructure forum that we ran as a part of that and seeing that mirrored to some extent by the event which was held and, and hosted by the president last week I think is a real demonstration of the kind of the, the, the government to government partnerships and then the, the profitability of that that we can see. Um, we've also seen that kind of cascade down down to the provincial level. I think there's, there's, there's real importance in engaging at both national and provincial level here in South Africa. Um, and I think the hope is that with, with the kind of the consolidation of sort of policy, the increased uh, rigor in prioritization through the SIDS methodology, we'll see that reflected in uh, an increased ability to kind of move on things at a provincial level as well. Um, so I think, you know, absolutely we are, we are seeing movement on it, but, but I'll, I'll return to what I said at the beginning in that, that there are, there are critical details to be worked through in terms of funding, um, funding structures, um, in terms of legislative environment um, that, that, that need to happen um, before that kind of really positive government to government engagement can really uh, drive, uh, you know, a pickup in, in, in projects on the ground. Yeah, th thanks, Sean. Uh, Fred, looks like you wanted to come in there. Yeah, sorry. So I was, does that tally with your experience, Vivian, as well, in terms of what you're seeing? Yeah, yeah, Leon. So absolutely. And I think just to hook on to Sean's last point, um, as much as we've got the political alignments, we need to, as industry, sort of wrench it out of, out of the political hands and, and then sort of engineer them, make them, make them work. And I think that's yeah. where... Uh, when we are talking about the tools, the expertise that we can bring to the table, whether it's UK businesses or, or Chinese businesses, uh, going back to whether it's project prep or the five case model that the UK um, technical assistance is trying to provide into the SA government, for instance, um, what are the uh, practical, pragmatic tools we need to make to to start developing those projects? Uh, the information is there. Um, yeah, we need to now find those and activate those triggers, and we need to make those commitments. So we need to make those commitments in terms of um, for getting the confidence up. And I think that it, going back to the the spread we've seen in timelines, we need to get the confidence back. The confidence back is when we see that flow of projects happening. To get that flow of projects happening, we need the industry players closer to these projects. So whereas um, PICC and uh, maybe post uh, pre-COVID, we had uh, the administration that tried to manage this very centrally, I think we now need to reach out. If we, if we want to really talk collaboration, then this is we have to collaborate from the very onset and make those projects uh, feasible. The, the, the practicality is those involved, like like Fred's firm, in the actual delivery of the projects uh, that have seen what works practically needs to bring that into the front end loading of the projects, so that you shape projects that are viable, that are actually going to meet uh, funders' requirements, and that's a practical. It's we have to reshape the utopian views so that we can deliver the projects in the short term, in the, in the sort of the first, uh, in the first year, in the second year, and phase them in. And I think that's the tools and techniques that are available and we need to use. And, and as industry, that's our, that's our role. We, we need to, to charge in there and, and wrestle the projects out and, and, and showcase and use those tools. I think funding is key. And I think as yeah. much as, um, we need to, and, and the president mentioned this as well, we need to bring money to the table. 
and whether it's a UK export finance, looking at different uh, modalities in terms of bringing that, uh, uh, looking at different ways of providing softer loans. So BRICS Bank, for instance, is looking at, uh, the NDB is looking at uh, um, um, uh, extending mm -hmm. repayment terms, for instance. So we need to make the funding accessible and put the money down in order to actually get the projects working. The, pro the, the are projects waiting. We, we know of project facilities, but we need to get that flywheel going uh, so that the projects can actually start churning. And assurance. I think the biggest thing is like uh, Fred mentioned as well, for every dollar pound of, of rand spent capital, we need to see return. So leakages in the system are gonna become more costly. And that's where triple layers of assurance that we need on all major projects and all capital projects needs to be uh, put in place up front. Um, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Vivian. It kind of highlights the point around F FDI and getting that investment in play. I'll perhaps come back to that. I can see we have a few questions, Cecilia. Yeah. We've got, and I think particularly when it comes to projects and actually making them work, um, when you've got some funding already to um, McLean Sabanda was asking, particularly also for Fred, um, but I think everyone on our panel, possibly Vivian too, would have some, some good input here. What should Africa do to improve the PPP regime? How could Africa create an appropriate unsolicited bid regime to ensure private sector gets involved? Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, I'll, I'll probably start for me. Um, I think, as I said earlier, a triple model model is not a simple model. It's more complicated than traditional project models, and uh, it requires uh, the public, both public sectors and private sectors, to contribute uh, to to play a very important role, especially for the government, for the public sector. Uh, in terms of Africa, um, uh, to we should really think about: Will the traditional triple model really work in in Africa? As I said earlier, there are a lot of issues related in Africa to uh, where triple models are, are being implemented. Like the, the, the governments are, uh, are facing debt issues and, and, and a lot of infrastructure are poorly managed. And, and, uh, and the legal system, the financial system, the market itself are not as complete as other developed markets. So to really think about to an, an improved triple P regime, I think, we all, both public sectors and private sectors need to start with improving themselves. For the public sector, they should start improving themselves in terms of completing and, and accepting sound financial and market system uh, to give confidence to the private sector. And for the, for the private sector, for the enterprises, and, and think uh, everybody needs to become really more con uh, um, creative. Innovations need to be made in terms of improving triple B model. Um, apparently, uh, in, in Africa, the private sector will play a bigger role in terms of the partnership rather than uh, countries like China and, and, and UK. Um, and by playing a bigger part, and it means uh, a bigger risk. So how will the private sector perceive the risk and contain the risk is really a problem facing everybody. Um, in terms of unsolicited bid regime, I think uh, it's a double, double edged sword. Uh, we support uh, uh, public tenders for triple P model because it will create competition and, and, and made a better outcome is, uh, than an unsolicited bid, but it depends. Uh, there are a lot of mega projects um, of, uh, and a lot of bad examples in Africa. Uh, projects are going through tender processes and it's been taking forever and uh, yeah. people are not seeing outcomes um, and uh, things are keeping uh, are delayed. And also because of that, a lot of um, uh, private companies are wasting their money and, and, and resources. Uh, they're putting a lot of efforts in there, but at the end of the day, the problem is not happening. So it is really uh, about uh, uh, how we see the project and uh, the nature of the project. Um, it's not about whether it's solicited or unsolicited. Um, uh, so that the public and the private sector need to sit down together on specific projects and see the right way of, of implementing it. Thanks, Fred. I think as we enter our last 10 minutes, I'll just move on to our next poll and encourage any, any questions from the audience that we can get in before the end of this, this session. Uh, essentially, everyone's talked about the requirement for FDI. Uh, and 
what are those barriers to FDI? What is, nothing's going to radically change throughout lockdown, but what do we need to do going forward? So it'd be great to ask the audience, what are your main concerns regarding foreign funded uh, executed infrastructure projects in South Africa and indeed the rest of Africa? We all know there are lots of challenges around mobility of labor. Uh, uh, Vivian very nicely referred to leakages in the system. Equally, we, we talked about some of the utopian objectives, we're really referring back to reimagining the, the space of infrastructure. But it'd be interesting to see what the audience thinks in terms of the main concerns. Is there anything that perhaps we could add from our observations uh, beyond what Fred and Vivian have said in terms of that reluctance that we might be seeing from an FDI perspective, or what indeed South Africa and the region could do more of to encourage uh, more bilateral, trilateral trade flows in this space? I can see you wanting to answer there, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> you must have read my very straight face extremely effectively. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I mean, you'll be you'll be well aware that that the UK sees um, kind of uh, the promotion and increase of, of FDI flows into Africa as as a as a key yeah. strategic priority for us. It was the reason that the, the Prime Minister hosted the investment summit back in January, um, and it's something that is, is is a big focus for our time, and it, it's an area that we see as a real strength for the UK um, in terms of what we can bring bring to the party. Um, but but ultimately, you know. Um, we as government are here to support UK investors, but it's the UK investors who will act. Um, and I think when we speak to them, you know, there's, there's a range of, of concerns which will be familiar to, to everyone on this call and, and, and to those on the panel. Um, you know, um, uh, investor security, um, you know, difficulties around um, kind of, um, you know, uh, local content, local labour uh, legislation. Um, and at the moment, you know, um, yeah, looking at, at, at the situation in emerging markets, um, you know, there's been a lot of capital flight. There are, there are concerns around, yeah. um, you know, sort of debt sustainability, et cetera. Um, it, it's not a natural time for, um, for, for, for investors to be um, unrisk averse, if you like. Uh, and so I think, yeah. you know, really for us, it, it, it's about, um, you know, advocating for those incentive measures. It's about advocating for, um, you know, a strong investment climate. Um, it's about pitching the opportunity, um, but it's about being picky and choosy. Uh, and I think that's why, you know, we, we come back to, we come back to the sustainable uh, infrastructure development symposium last week. We come back to this idea of a prioritized list of projects. And I think, you know, 55 projects we've been promised that sounds great um even sort of you know 10 would be fantastic and i think this, this is something which was raised by by one of the the, the the president's investment envoys a few projects which show genuinely viable um and interesting returns with with a strong legislative um, framework around them would be critical to building up that confidence um, and would be critical to to, to to supporting us, to be frank, as the UK government, to make the case yeah. to UK investors that this is a place that you want to put money, that this is a place where you can secure returns, that this is a place where um, you know uh, our money can also do good. And that is something which yeah. concerns UK investors. So, uh, you know, I think it, it's a it's a, a serious priority for us, but there are there are substantial challenges and we shouldn't underestimate those, particularly in the current climate. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thanks, Emma. Yeah. Yeah, just to build off of those um, uh, excellent comments, uh, Sean, um, uh, just to, to say, you know, since, since that investment summit in January, we, you know, we haven't um, uh, been doing nothing uh, for the last five months. Uh, one of the things that we have been doing is talking to the private equity firms um, you know, who, uh, who are sort of awash across um, uh, London and the UK. Um, so some of the stuff that they've been telling us, obviously, we know that um, you know, the, the investment flows globally uh, have, have been hit very dramatically. Um, and within that then, what does that mean for Africa particularly? And you know, investors, of course, you know, we're seeing that sort of increased interest around ESG and social, social investment, impact investing and that sort of thing. So a big drive in that. Um, but actually investors still do need to see a return on that investment. Um, and so, um, so when they're looking, when, when times are tough and they are looking for what is the best return I can get, it's, 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 a, it's a highly competitive um, market uh, and Africa doesn't always stack up very well against the competition. So some of the things that they were talking about particularly are around political risk. 
um, uh, and indeed you know, just the instability of the policy, the regulatory legislative environment uh, in some markets across Africa. They're talking about the need to at least get their money back, so the need to, to have much more in terms of payment protection. Um, the challenges around access to foreign exchange and uh, you know the limited sort of local currency um, investment uh, stuff. So you know having to take on that uh, the sort of currency fluctuation piece, um, you know, as well as just then the overall length of time it can take to go from concept to delivery of a project, um, which you know as, as Fred has been saying, you know is is all linked in with you know sort of transparency and standards and consistency of implementation of um, of processes and legislation. So, so it's not an easy fix, uh, and, but I think you know, it has certainly made our ambition of um, driving more investment flows from the UK into Africa a little bit more complicated, um, uh, yeah. but, it, but it has also really shone a spotlight on all of these issues, which were problems before and are exacerbated yeah. now. Yeah. I, I, I think, think that, sorry if I can ahead, come in. Go ahead, yeah. Um, Emma's just actually been speaking to some of our questions that we've had from attendees, and um, particularly Gary Davis saying, you know, he's concerned about the currency fluctuations and what that would mean to move this funding across borders, particularly. It is a challenge. Um, and I, I think also that the real question is how, how secure is the MOI and the alliance between Africa, UK and China for these projects when we, we are aware of these currency fluctuations that are possibly going to get worse, but also should political relations between China and UK become a bit rocky again? We know these things comes and go, they come and go. How, how politics proof almost is this alliance? And I know it's a tricky question, but I'm gonna put it to the panel. Perhaps Fred, you and I could take that one as uh, essentially co-signatories of, of the understanding. Uh, and so from my perspective, um, representing British business in South Africa and the broader region, it's really to address the, the business requirements and the business need, serving the local economy and community, community where we find ourselves and live and are trying to grow our businesses. So essentially, we can have great business to business relationships, which I think are critical. So be it from Turner Townsend or Fred's organization, the, the Chinese Railway, regardless of what might be going on in certain parts of the world. We can drive those relationships in a very human, interpersonal level. Uh, you know, I drive past Fred's house every evening when I go home, so we could, we could resolve any problems by just going face to face. So it's not to say we operate in isolation from what's going on on a ma macro political perspective, but this goes beyond our bilateral government relationships. It goes to the respective chambers relationships and then our human relationships. And I believe that that can help mitigate any political change that happens. But of course, Britain and then China want to maintain great trade relations and great political relations. But here we're really about driving those, those business relationships and those human relationships. And as Vivian said in October last year, and he said again today, we've signed this, so what? What are we going to do? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pushing on because we're running out of time, which is great because we've had so much interaction and so many questions. Uh, perhaps we could share the results of the last poll that I think Emma and Sean spoke to somewhat in terms of our next question. Our main concerns are not enough use of local labor, uh, non-compliance with local environmental laws, treatment of workers, but largely increasing indebtedness of African governments. And, and, and that is what we said. I think in terms of before going to any kind of concluding points from the panel, just, just to really reiterate what, what the panel have said and what Emma and Sean have said, the UK really is very keen to increase and continue trade flows into Africa. We are here selling the case for African business, for investment into South Africa. And with Fred and the Sasita agreement, we want to do that collectively and see where we can come together. That doesn't mean that we, we operate in a vacuum and are not aware of some of these challenges. And these challenges existed pre-COVID. So what the COVID situation gives us is this opportunity to reimagine this space Really, these, these issues that we struggle with, be they uh, sustainability, employment of local workforce, mobility of talent, those problems are now exacerbated. So we really have to have a laser-like focus in addressing them. And hopefully this post-COVID rebuilding brick by brick enables to address these pro problems more quickly. Because as we've all discussed, perhaps in a best case scenario, we've got a one to three year recovery. We don't want that to stretch into a five to 10 year recovery or actually into a 
a continuous decline, a continual decline over the next 25 years. So I'm going to perhaps just hand over to our panelists one by one. Again, we could probably talk for another two hours, and I think we should have a follow-up webinar. But maybe just some final comments and observations from, from each panelist, starting with Emma, just to kind of what we've taken away from this and what perhaps is a silver lining we can hold on to as we move on beyond this webinar. Great, thanks, Leon. Um, so, you know, if we cast our minds back uh, six months to the beginning of the year, um, so many of us, uh, I know that there were challenges, particularly here in South Africa, but actually just so many of us were, were excited about the year ahead. We had this great momentum, uh, really you know, ambitious, exciting goals. Um, and we were, we were you know, just sort of just primed and ready to ready to go um, and you know we have been absolutely sort of knocked on our back in some respects by this um, pandemic um, but I think positivity energy d a drive um, count for a huge amount and I think if we all just sort of stand back and think um, you know, COVID is a bugger isn't it um, and it's destroyed my business um, then then you know that becomes um, a self-fulfilling prophecy what I'm inspired by is this strong drive and motivation to pick ourselves up shake ourselves off and figure out how we get back to uh, to sort of, you know, making money uh, and making the world a better place um, and to do that as quickly as possible. Transforming our businesses, reimagining our businesses and our lifestyles. Um, so I think that there is opportunity and, and I think that there's a really exciting future for us to build together. Uh, and these kinds of conversations really help to, to kind of maintain that momentum towards that, that end point. Yeah, th thank you, Emma. Sean. Yeah, thanks, Leon, and uh, thanks for, for a great session. I think two two uh, reflections from me. Um, so, so the first, um, building on what um, Vivian was actually saying, is that you know let, let's lose the, the the time and space, but also the kind of the added scrutiny and pressure of COVID nineteen uh, to make good decisions about prioritisation, to influence those decisions which are being made by government, to think about how infrastructure can be delivered profitably, but also can be delivered to create impact in the real world that we want to see and can be a supportive factor in, in the recovery. Um, and, you know, let's not waste this time uh, is, is reflection number one. And reflection number two, I think, is, you know, the, the big focus for us um, as the DIT here in South Africa over the coming uh, months will be about turning the, the, the really positive political uh, commitments um, that we're seeing both on the South African and, and the UK side uh, into, into practical projects which will go ahead. And, and that, that is about how we partner with, 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 with UK companies, with Chinese companies and with South African counterparts um, to, to respond to and begin to deliver on um, a lot of the promise which is being spoken about in the infrastructure space. And I think you know, now is the moment that we really need to, to focus on the nuts and bolts of getting things done. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. Appreciate that. Fred. Yeah, and, and of, of course, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is always that, why don't we just take actions? But, but of course, because of this context and, and there, there won't be an action that we can take immediately, but I think that at least we can take actions to, to make joint research on markets, to make investigations on, on, on possible solutions to the, to the African continent. And, um, and I always saying that let's start with something. It's, let's start, I don't care whether it's small or big. Let's start with something that is on the table, that is, that is tangible, that is right before our eyes, that people can lay their hands on and we can start working together as a team. Without something on the table, um, and, and I mean, we can keep talking, we can have similar seminars for another 10, but I think uh, it's always very important for us, for the UK and Chinese co uh, partners to come together, identify the right projects and start working on it. Yeah, thank you, Fred. V Vivian. I don't think I can end this without using Churchill, a uh, Churchill quote, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I think there's two things that we know. We, we, um, we are not at the beginning of the crisis. We don't know if they're at the end. Yeah. And at the same time, we know that when the end comes, we want to accelerate out of the starting blocks. So we are not at the beginning. We've had our period of, of looking inward and, and now it's time to look outward and, and be ready to accelerate out of the blocks. To relook at your business, realign your business, take stock of what you need to be, go back to your core, and, and that will give you the right recipe, I think, for, for, for speeding up the blocks. 
uh, all the answers that we still have to make, you know, they're still there. Uh, the debt questions are still there. We, we know, I think the G20 spoke about debt suppression, you know, so there are mechanisms out there to alleviate some of the debt issues, but um, let's, let's, let's plan for the, for the sprinting out of the blocks. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you. And Genghis, thank you so much for your opening presentation. Do you have any observations or final remarks before we let you go back into the Tokyo night? S South Japanese night, not quite Tokyo. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Leon. Um, I mean, it's yeah. been a really fascinating discussion and hopefully it's something that can be continued. I mean, there's, there's so many, so much ground to cover here. Um, really just to, to, to echo the, the closing remarks. I mean, I think, um, you know, this time is obviously a, a, a period of, of, of preparation and reflection. I mean, I think from, from some of the things I'm seeing maybe across, across the continent, opportunities for, um, you know, projects and for recovery could come along, um, you know, quicker than we think. Um, and, and so let's not be complacent and let's, not, let's also not make, um, you know, the perfect the enemy of the good. You know, we, we, we're not going to have perfect projects, perfect PPPs, perfect uh, you know host government conditions um echo what fred is saying let's get on and um and and you know try it whether it's an unsolicited proposal whether it's tendered whatever it might be all of these things are going to need to coexist um going forwards um and hopefully it's you know it's going to be green and it's going to be sustainable um but also we need you know we need recovery yesterday so um so um so with that in mind i think um you know it's, it's just echoing whatever everything else that's been said already thanks Thanks, Jengis. Any observations, concluding comments from you, Cecilia? Um, yes, uh, just first of all, I want to say we, we haven't gotten to everybody's questions, but um, you can drop us an email at any stage and we can try and maybe put you in contact with someone. And we're happy to do that. Particularly, I know Nicholas from NMS had, had quite a, a relevant question to you about workforce issues, local versus foreign and how we close this divide. And, and it made me think also to slot in with what Jengis has said. I think um, there's very seldom in life, in anything, a, a perfect relationship. And relationships are gonna go through ups and downs, but perhaps more lasting is an alliance of shared goals and determination to see them through. And I think this is what this alliance is about, and particularly at this juncture, Africa can be almost a blank canvas where we can build not just the future cities, but future countries. And I think with determination and a strong alliance, um, any political upheaval or bumps in the roads, we can see it through and, and close the divides. Thanks, Cecilia. I just really like to thank, firstly, the, the audience for participating in a very lively debate. I sense there's appetite for more questions and more answers. So we should really look at perhaps you know, we just don't want to do a series of seminars. We want action, as you say, Fred, but perhaps we can keep this dialogue going regularly. And that's a great way of our first step forward in terms of really bringing our partnership together. I'd really like to thank uh, Emma Wade Smith, Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner. Thank you so much for your insights and giving us your time. Likewise, Sean, Country Director in South Africa. Thank you both for your ongoing support with the Chamber. You really do give us a great platform and allow us to punch above our weight. So we really appreciate that. Fred, really good to engage in this partnership with you. I hear you, we need to start doing it. We need to start putting uh, things in place so we're more than a talking shop. We said that all along. COVID threw us a curveball, but let's take that curveball and run with it. Vivian, as ever, I'm delighted you decided to stay with the Chamber when we did that signing. Great to have you on board. Uh, we are really here to leverage you, our members, both our panelists and indeed those in the audience. And Jenga, thank you so much for your contributions for, from Southern Japan. All the very best of luck getting back to China. And we look forward to perhaps inviting you to another webinar. Uh, Cecilia, as always, thank you very much for feeding in the questions and keeping it interactive. Ema Emission Control for our, managing our polls and Leslie and Venice behind the scenes for making sure we're all in the same place at the same time. And Sarah Green from the, from the Foreign Office, really thank you so much for kind of being the driving force behind this, marshalling us and getting the topics on track. Let's, let's keep moving forward on this. Vivian, 